February 19, 2021 began like every other day for Emmanuel. In the morning, the morning of Friday 19th, uh, February 2021, I was to go to worry because I just moved to my apartment and I needed to get some things from Wari. So I drove my car by myself to Wari. On my way getting to the Benin Bypass, uh, they were, we, just, we just heard gunshots. It didn't really sound like gunshots at that time. It sounded more like tire, you know, getting bust on the way. And because we were about four cars within that proximity, we, didn't, we couldn't tell which one was which. Even me too, I was trying to check whether it's my car and the other ones, I saw them holding their brakes. So we just assumed it was, you know, a tire bust. But all of a sudden, it was getting more and more in the air. The sound of the gun was getting more and more. So we, I realized that there was something happening, but I couldn't tell where. And since the cars in front of me were holding brakes, I had to hold my own too assuming the activity was to take place in front, but not knowing that it was already around us. Before I turned to my left, there were young men coming out from the bush area with guns. There was already someone in front with uh, this AK-47 machine gun. There was already someone behind us. So we're trapped in the middle. The day turned out to be one of the longest days of his life. They just started shouting that we should all come out of the car, come out of the car. So my car is already stopped, so I raised my hand, opened the door, they were getting close to me. Just opened the door, I came out. As I was coming out, the car in front of me, just, whether it was out of fear, I don't know, just out of, just zoomed, but he knows he couldn't go forward, so he swept into the bush to the right side. I just heard the leader give a command that they should follow that car. They knew they, it wasn't going anywhere. So they followed the car inside. We just heard gunshots and, and that was all. There were about seven at the time, but five of them went back again to the road. So it was only two guys that escorted me into the bush, one in front holding a gun and a machete. The other one behind also holding a gun and a machete. So they just said we should be, I should be walking inside. I know how to speak a little Hausa, so I was already trying to see if I can beg them with the Hausa language, just to, they shouldn't harm me and all that, that I'll cooperate in whatever they want. They just said, I should be going, I should be going. For about 45 minutes, he walked barefoot in the bush. At some point, they dug out hidden items from the ground and gave him a bag to carry. They continued working until they got to what Emmanuel described as an open space. And then, this happened. He started asking me, questions from my phone he looked at he said i should open my phone with my password i gave them the password opened it and then he started showing me pictures who is this person i said it's a friend i know you will see a picture where i snap picture um, with a car they will ask me who owns the car i said it's just a picture i snap at the side of the car they say no that the car is my own i said that's not my car that the car i have is the one that is on the road they said okay that i'm lying that i want to die I said, no, I don't want to die. You know, I saw they snapped, and I snapped one other picture with, uh, I was at the side of a house. They showed me the picture and said, who owns the house? I said, I don't own the house. That house, I just snapped by the side. They said, I'm lying, that that house is my own. I said, I just rented a new apartment. So if I, if I own a house, why would I be renting a new apartment? They said, I want to die, that I want to die. That do I know who they are? I said, I don't know. They said, have I heard of kidnapping before? I said, yes. He said, I've just been kidnapped. And if I don't have 50 million to ransom myself, one bullet to my head. I said, I don't want to die, that I'm going to cooperate, that I'm going to cooperate. And I said, how much do I have? I said, you should look at my um, account balance in my phone. The guy got angry and said, no, I don't want your account balance. I want to hear what you have to say. He said, tell me, how much do you have? And I said, I have. 70,000 naira. He stood up from where he was sitting, walked up to me and gave me a heavy punch on the face. For a man who had just 70,000 naira in his account, one can only imagine his state of mind. Finding out that your tribesman is part of your kidnappers only made things worse. 
So I now said, please, I don't have money, but I don't want to die. They said, so I have family people who can gather money for me. I stayed there. I couldn't say anything. He said, answer. Who can we call? I now said, I, I don't know. So he got angry and said, maybe you are not understanding what I'm saying. He now called one other person. He said, come and talk to your guy. When that one came, sat close to me and was to speak, his accent was horrible. I was shocked, but I couldn't really say anything. You know, so he was now telling me, he said, hey, this guy is with here, so they not get joy. He was really speaking like a worry or benign person who has, you know, like these um, worry guys. He said, these guys, they not get joy, they not get joy, they could shoot you, they could buy you here, or if you not get money, or if, if, you, if you want, I feel tell them, I feel negotiate with them for 30 million for you. If not, they'd already to say, if you not get 50 million, they will kill you. But if you feel raised like 30 million, I go talk to them for you. May they not kill you. So I now stayed there. Say, who will we call? Who can we call? And I said, it's only my wife that they can call at this point. So he now told the leader, say, he said, now a wife, they won't call them. So he now told them, said, they should give me my phone. Let me call my wife. I had a phone call. The leader was making a phone call. He was speaking Hausa most of the time to a girl on the phone. When he was, he was really sounding as if he was a quiet, calm person on the phone. He was talking to her and was like, ah, how are you? My babe in Hausa, my babe, how are you? Uh, sorry, I couldn't come to meet you yesterday. I didn't close early from work. But today, hopefully, I will close early. I will, I will make out time to come and I see you, you know, we're just talking, laughing and making promises. You hardly know from his tone that he's that kind of person. You know, after the call, another person also put a call through. The same thing to a girl, said all he could and all that and cut the call. And all of a sudden there was calmness. The next thing I heard was small snoring gradually. It appeared that they were resting. There is a story being told today because Emmanuel escaped. But how did he do that? One of them was facing the gun at me, and the one behind him was making arrangement to pray. This is their usual uh, Islamic prayer. So the one just facing me would look at me a while, and then turn and look at the other guy that was praying, would look at me a while, turn and look at the other guy that was praying. So right there, I just, I just said, God help me. The only thing I could think of was to run. The moment we were there. So I was just waiting for a slight distraction. He was holding a gun and a sharp machete. So I looked at him, was watching him closely while he was just doing that turn, doing that turn. So the moment I noticed that he has turned away to the other guy, I just stood up from where they said I should bend down and I jumped into the bush and started running. My thought was that the bush was open. You know, so probably I will go a distance, but no. The moment I was running, I just discovered that the bush is like net. The moment you run towards it, if you don't have knife to maybe cut your way through, it will just catch you up like net. So you won't go far. So with the speed I was even using, it was forcing me and just holding me back. And I heard the guy say, hey, and started pushing. So he was running after me. And I was, I was still trying to struggle through that place, but the more I get through, it was already holding me up. So the only thing I could do was to just turn. As I turned, I saw him coming with the machete. I ran back to him, and then we just, I just held the machete that I was holding, and then we started struggling. We were struggling, we were struggling. In my mind was, if he gets a hold of that machete, I'm done. While we were struggling, he was calling the other guy, but that guy couldn't stand up because we were already praying. So we struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled. He used his head to hit me. I also reversed the head and then he tried to see if he can roll me, you know, tumble me to the ground. I fell on the ground and rolled him back again as if I want to come on top of him. But he, I don't know how it didn't work out. So we rolled back again and I fell back. I was now on the ground looking at him. He's very tall, so he used his leg to suspend towards my neck area like this and started pulling the knife away from me. 
So he pulled and pulled and pulled, we're struggling. I was just using probably the last strength I had to hold back, but it wasn't working. So as he pulled it off from me, the next thing I just saw was, he was just returning the knife as if he was butchering cow. The struggle went on for a while, but Emmanuel was eventually overpowered. But there was a twist coming. As he laid bleeding with his leg broken, the leader came to his aid. The leader looked around and went into the bush, brought a stick, something like this, but singular, and then brought it to me, cut it to size, and said, see if you can use this to walk. I now held the stick. I stood up with it, but I couldn't walk with it. The moment I tried to move, I would just fall again to the ground. The guy just laughed and said, if you can't walk, then we'll just shoot you. My mouth was dry. I, I couldn't talk. I was just saying, please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. I will walk. I will walk. He saw you. I tried. I got up again, tried it. I fell back again to the ground. He just laughed and said, try it one more time. I took it up. I got up. The moment I got up, I tried to take a step. I fell back to the ground. Right there and then, I was just expecting him to say, we will kill you. The next thing he just said is, we will leave you here. How did Emmanuel find his way to safety with a broken head, hand and leg? I removed my shirt to tie my head and my trouser I used to tie my leg. So it was only the boxers that was with me. I started using my elbow and my knees to crawl. I'll crawl a bit to a distance. I will stop and see if I can regain strength. I will breathe, I will breathe, I will breathe, I will breathe. I was just speaking to myself that it's the long God has made them not to kill me, that I will not die inside the bush. Let's rewind a bit. Remember the kidnapper who caught him to bits? Well, he apparently didn't like the leader's decision to let Emmanuel go. The moment he just saw me as I was creeping out, he opened the grass to see me properly and laughed, that kind of cynical laugh as Nobby you be this, and the moment he just did that, he cocked the gun and faced me. Right there, I, it was like I was, I was just tattooed. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't run. I was just there looking at him. Within that split second, I was just expecting the gun to just fire and then I'm gone. But from nowhere, the leader, that same guy that gave me that stick, he just ran back, stood in front of me and the Fulani, guy and held the gun to the corner I was now talking to his ears he was just talking just talking I wasn't hearing what he was saying but he was just talking he was just talking so from where I was the fear and all that I was not saying say you people said you will not kill me say you, you, you said you will not kill me you promised you will not kill me so he was not the one talking back to me he said nobody will kill you here come out from that place so he talked authoritatively to that guy and the guy angrily at, at the point, he was not saying, leave me, let me shoot this man, leave me, let me waste this man. So the guy talked, the moment he talked with him, he now angrily walked away. The same leader who initially wanted to kill him gave him directions on how to get to the road and what to do when he got there. It would be great if he was immediately rescued, but now. Nah. Cars were already speeding past like that, speed, speed, speed. So I tried to see if I can wave down any car. I removed my boxers that I was wearing to see if I can use it as flat so I was naked. I tried to wave, no car was stop. I was waving, waving, waving. The next thing I heard in the night was gunshot. Just heard it. The same way I heard that time in the afternoon that they caught me. And I started hearing them again shouting at a distance, although it's very far, but because it's night, it was quiet, so you could hear the sound. They were not saying, lie down, lie down. Come out now, come out from the car. Oh yeah, enter the bush, enter the bush. So me out of fear, I just ran to somewhere that's like the like a gutter, so that they probably they won't come again and see me. Finally, help did come from an unexpected source, Nigeria's military. Five of them came out of the car with heavy arms, took some positions. They were really trying to check the area. They just took some positions. So it was from there, the probably the leader now shouted towards me say, who are you? So I now called my name. I shout my name out. I said, my name is Mark Emmanuel. 
I said, if you are using an Android phone, I said, open Facebook, type my name, you will see my profile. So one of them now said, ah, he's talking, he's sound, he's sound. So they drew close to me and they was not asking me, why am I lying down on the ground? I said, my leg is broken. He said, why am I naked? I said, I actually removed my clothes to tie my head and my leg. He now asked me what happened. I explained the whole thing. Now ordered the military vehicle to turn. He now mount roadblock for me. And they started redirecting cars so that the cars don't come and hit me because I was already almost at the middle of the road. So he now ordered his men to put my knicker back on. He now told me, he said, they will not take me to the hospital because they have a direct order to come to the barrack. Say, but they will make sure they get a car that will carry me from where they, where they met me to the hospital. So they stood there, they were stopping cars in my presence, stopped and stopped and stopped. One of the guys now suggested that, ah, Oga, nobody could stop for this man, an ambulance will be stopped. Oh. All of a sudden, an ambulance was passing through. He just waved down the ambulance and stopped the ambulance and told him, said, I am giving you a direct order. This man is not dead, he's only badly injured. He can talk, he can respond. He said, take him to the hospital. While he was going through this, his wife of nine years had quickly come to the realization after countless efforts to reach him and calls to family and friends, as well as prayers with your children, that something terrible had happened. So I remembered that my husband always uses location. So what I did was I went into his Gmail and put in his password and I went to his last location and I zoomed it. That was when I knew that the way the car slided in the map and stopped at that Benin bypass, I knew that this one is something happened. The next call was around, I think, seven. It was the ambulance man, that, the ambulance driver that called. He said, I'm bringing your husband and all that. So he said, your husband wants to talk to you. So I said, give me the phone, give me the phone. As he gave me the phone, as my husband was talking, I just said, all the tears I was holding, I started crying. So my landlord's wife came out and saw me crying. So she now called her husband out. And in the tears, I started explaining everything to him. He never thought he would be a victim. <laughs> never dreamt he would be telling this kind of story. Life has gotten a new meaning for me. It's like I was high up, you know, scouting for how to make it, how to become somebody and all that. And all of a sudden, I just came over to the point where the very simple things of life is only what matters. And for me, what are the simple things? My children, my wife, my family, they are happy.